to hear about this. Okay. And uh, I listened partly to the sharing of Gusti and they are very much related, maybe just to to uh, to elaborate a little more about to, uh, how I see the formation of religious being synodal. I was also a formator myself for several years before working in Rome. It's a little easier for us to make our formation synodal because religious life is essentially based on co-equal missionary discipleship. We are not hierarchical in nature. We are more circular or holarchical. In fact, Nomen Gentium 44 affirms that religious life is constituted with the profession of the evangelical councils and does not belong to the hierarchical structure of the church. So the ontological distinction, distinction does not exist among members in the same religious community. And governance is not <laughs> even tied to ordination. Uh, lately, Pope Francis made a change in Canon 588. In Canon 588, paragraph 2, it says that in clerical religious congregations like the Claritians, like the Jesuits, for example, only clerics can be superiors. But the Pope has derogated from that provision so that in clerical religious congregations, brothers can be elected or appointed as major superiors. So the chameleons, after this uh, change of Canon 588, designated two provincials who are brothers. And uh, the congregation of the Holy Cross, which is also a clerical congregation, elected the first superior general who is a brother. So for us to talk about synodal formation may not be very difficult. Secondly, the term of office of superiors for a certain period of time makes it easier for us to understand synodality in the context of religious life. In fact, the law does not favor long-serving superiors or recycled ones. Of course, it also varies from one congregation to another in consideration to the needs and the availability of prospective leaders. So when one finishes the term as superior, he returns to the ranks with no residual authority, rank or power. It's not like bishops when they, when they become emeritus, they are still bishops. And the, the culture and the, the residual power is still there now. But for us, no. In fact, our former superior general who was appointed as cardinal by Pope Francis serves as Kirillo Bocos, I'm talking about him. See, he serves as a porter from time to time in the community where he lives. He's a beautiful. And thirdly, power in the context of religious life is not consecrate, concentrated on one person. The power to legislate is given to the chapters. The executive power and Judicial powers are given to major superiors. So it's not a hierarchical model where all the powers, like in the case of the bishop, legislative, executive, and judicial powers are concentrated. The, also, the presence of the council promotes checks and balances. Many times we ask the consent or the advice of the council members. We have also other organs of participation, like the assemblies, so in the context of consecrated life, we treat one another as friends, co-equal partners. We do not treat our superiors as boss, not from the position of servitude, like a servant serving his master. Rather, it is a humble service given by a friend to his friends, like the one rendered by Jesus to his disciples. Homical friends. I'd like to begin my sharing from this perspective that friendship is a good model for religious life. So here 
Jesus from John 13, verse 13 to 15. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And it's good to look at synodality, to look at religious life from the perspective of, of friendship. The first point is a synodal religious formation treats the formants as co-equal friends. Sometime in early 2015, there was this encounter in Colegio Filipino among Filipinos, lay persons, religious and priest with Cardinal Tagli as our resource person. The conversation centered on the visit of Pope Francis to the Philippines following the software typhoon Yolanda that brought havoc to Eastern Visayas. One of the questions, a very intriguing question addressed to the Cardinal during the question and answer portion had something to do with the perceived close relationship between the Holy Father and the Cardinal as can be deduced from the way they hug each other. They hug very tightly. We witnessed this tight embrace at St. Peter's Basilica during the blessing of the mosaic of St. Pedro Calungsud. And as soon as Pope Francis set foot on Philippine soil, where they were asking, why did uh, Pope Francis hug Cardinal Tagli like no other, not even Sok Villegas, who was the president of the CBCP at the time. And in response to this curiosity, the Cardinal said that he and Pope Francis were already friends even before Cardinal Bergoglio assumed this very important leadership role in the church. He said they were already friends. And when you are friends, you do not change your relationship even if you change your roles over time. It is true that true friendship transcends space and time. I would like to use friendship as the model of religious life. We should begin in our initial formation. Jesus' self-gift was an act of friendship. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. So the Lord demonstrated to his disciples that genuine service is rooted in the love of friendship where we are fully conscious of our being co-equal. I heard Gosti saying that in the FEBC Citizens Report, two things were highlighted, that it should be a Christ-centered formation and a learn, learner-centered learner formation. So the first requirement of being synodal in formation for me is to be convinced that both formators and the formants play an important role in formation work. In this type of formation, the formators and the formants need to work together. And it begins with the process of building mutual trust by listening. We often talk about clericalism as the worst enemy of a synodal church that needs to be challenged from the earliest stages of formation. We hear a lot from Pope Francis' mouth about clericalism. But he also says on several occasions that one does not need to be a cleric to be clerical. Clericalism is not only the problem of clerics. Religious who live with the attitude of segregation, with their nose up in the air, are also clerical in the wider sense of the word. You can hear more about this in this booklet, The Strength of Vocation. Pope Francis talks clearly about clericalism there. For him, it's a form of aristocracy or elitism. Pope Francis loves to invent <laughs> New words, no? like the word balconizing. Balconizing is somebody who stands on the balcony and does not participate. So a formator who does not participate with the formants during manualia, during working hours, is also a clerical in nature, even if he's a brother. He's a formator who is balconizing. A formator who does not know how to listen 
is also a clinical formator or a formator with a problem of clericalism. So friendship is inclusive and there's no place for exclusion, segregation, or discrimination. In a synodal formation, all becomes members of the same family. It's gifted differently with equal opportunities to grow. Our tendency in formation work, I observe this even during my time, is to reward those who are performing well, even in our in the ambit of the classrooms, in the family setting, in the community. We look for those who are excelling. We reward them. We look for we look forward to seeing somebody who is very early in the chapel, if we are formator. And we have the tendency to, <laughs> to uh, give credit and to, to reward them. Now, if we talk about peripheries, maybe this is the invitation to look for the peripheries in our formation houses, in the classrooms, in our places of assignment. And we can see how Jesus accompanied his disciples. I also heard Gusti mentioning this. And maybe the way how Jesus accompanied Judas could be a point of preference, a paradigm that he did not give up on Judas. It was Judas who let go of Jesus. No. <laughs> Jesus washed his feet. Jesus invited him for this uh, meal, for the Last Supper. And this is a good uh, paradigm to look for the peripheries in our in our formants. And as formators, formation work should be our top priority as assignment. When we have only one or two for Monday, we have the tendency to look for other compensations, to look for other works. But its foreman deserves our full time and attention. Of course, it doesn't mean that we cannot embrace other minor works. But if ever you are a novice master and you, you only have one novice, you never know what God has in store for this low novice. It could be the future provincial or superior general of the congregation. But not only that, he deserves your full attention. In fact, when we talk about the novitiate, when we talk about absences of the novices, if you look into the spirit of the law, it's not only the absence of the novice, but also the absence of the novice master. Because how can the novice continue with the formative <clears throat> conferences without the novice master? Of course, I'm not discounting the possibility of having somebody to take his place. But if you look into the spirit of the law, if we see the interruption of the formation in the absence of the novice, we can also extend this interpretation as the absence of the novice master leaving the novice alone. Just to highlight that uh, once we are assigned as formators, we need to make formation work as our priority. The second point that I would like to, <clears throat> to, to stress, also related to the first one, in a synodal formation, the formants are involved in the decision-making processes. We now talk of formation ministry as a work of accompaniment, no, not more on formators, not more as teachers, but as companions in the journey. The work of formation as a whole is the fruit of the collaboration between those responsible for formation and their disciples. The whole synodal process is really communal discernment. It should not be unidirectional or top-bottom approach. That's why there's this invitation to, to empower our formants to be part of the discernment process. Of course, it varies from one stage to another. And uh, the directive, the document, Gusti also mentioned this earlier, directives on formation in religious institutes Putissimum Institutione in 1990 emphasizes that the religious themselves, the formants themselves, are responsible for their own formation. I would like to quote a portion of this document because 
very relevant in this <clears throat> in this line. It is the individual religious who holds the first responsibility for saying yes to the call which has been received and for accepting all the consequences of this response. The one who is called is therefore invited unceasingly to give an attentive, new, and responsible reply. The journey of its religious will recall that the journey of the disciples who were slow to the belief in Luke 24, 25, but who in the end were burning with fervor when the recent Lord revealed himself to them. I would say that it was only at the moment of the Pentecost when they really understood everything. This indicates the extent to which the formation to religious should be personalized. Lucy also talk about the cultural, cultural uh, diversities. Therefore, a right balance must be found between the formation of the group and that of its person, between the respect of the time and vision for its phase of formation and its adaptation to the rhythm of its individual. This, from the same document. And it's for this reason that Pope Francis acknowledges that <laughs> formation work now is very challenging. It is more difficult to be a religious formator now. It is more difficult to live as a consecrated person today. In the past, some disciples, some discipline protected us. The constitutions were sacrosanct. Now we talk about discernment. These days, According to Pope Francis, a consecrated person who does not develop the gift of discernment, even at the elemental level, is someone who is not meeting a current need. A consecrated person cannot be a little child. Discernment helps the consecrated person grow to adulthood. I love this uh, imagery of uh, winnowing pond, no? uh, when we separate the grain from the shop. In, in in our vernacular, because nigo, no? when we separate the grain of, of, of rice from the shop, we use the winnowing fan. That is discernment. It's the, the meaning of discernment. So how to involve them? How to involve the formants? Of course, depending on the level of formation, initial formation. Involve them in the making of the budget of the community. Involve them in the possible discernment whether to extend or not the novitiate or the perpetual profession or even the junior aid. Involve them in the choice of confessor. That is the basic right. Dialogue is the art that one learns from a synodal formation. Good formators teach us to listen and dialogue. Pope Francis, <laughs> when he congratulated the formators, he said, thank you for your apostolate of patient listening. Thirdly, for me, a synodal formation feels and acts with the church. Now we hear this phrase, centiricum ecclesia. Sometime in 2017, I had the chance to celebrate with Pope Francis at Domus Sancti Martes, Santa Marta. In one of his morning masses. I could not recall the gospel now, but he said to this effect that we need to be careful not to fall into, to fall into two temptations. One is temptation to move too fast so as to overtake the spirit. And the second temptation is to walk too slow, to, to be left behind by the spirit. We walk closely with the Spirit because this is the only way to remain faithful to the mission of God. That is why the task of formation is necessarily carried on in communion with the church. It is therefore necessary to develop among religious a manner of thinking, not only with, not only centiricum ecclesia, but as Saint Ignatius of Loyola also says, to think within the church because consecrated life is born in the womb of the church. We cannot go parallel to the church. This sense of the church consists in being aware that one belongs to a people on journey, a people which has its concrete source in the Trinitarian communion, which is rooted in human history, which is based upon the foundation of the apostles, 
and upon the pastoral ministry of their successors. Paul Francis calls this ecclesial insertion. The other enemy of ecclesial insertion is to, to be isolated. He also sometimes uses the term incarnation. Uh, formation should be incarnated, incarnated in the culture. I think Gusti emphasized this. I was going inside and out earlier. Uh, that we have to take into consideration the culture. We cannot go parallel with the church because religious life is born in the womb of the church. We must look at the past with gratitude, but not as... If we were looking at a museum piece, an artifact, now, because sometimes we have this nostalgia of the past, we always invoke, we did it in the past, this was the way our pioneers lived their life. Our founders are holy people, no doubt about that, but they are not Jesus Christ. They have opened us to a great path to follow. Maybe if you would ask your founders, they would also tell us, you live according to, to what the church demands or expects from you. They are our roots, and to go to our roots is to drink from there as in a fountain and to be able to respond to them adequately. Consecrated life is like water. It is, if it is stagnant, it putrefies. It smells. That's why uh, Pope Francis would always say that I would Love the church that is wounded but goes forth than a church that is self self preferential, auto referential, and it putrefies. Saint Pope John Paul the Twenty Third opened the windows of the church. Now Pope Francis is opening the door of the church, and it is in this context that canon law becomes an instrument by the church. Now sometimes we doubt. What is the role of canon law in the synodal church? Canon law serves as an instrument for a synodal church. That's why lately, Paul Francis made some changes. And I like to believe that more changes will be, will be done. Uh, canon law, our constitutions are not uh, uh, sacrosanct. I mean, they are not engraved in stones. They should be at the service of life and mission. That's why... At times, it is essential to, to retouch them to be able to respond to the exigencies of the times, even the use of our terminologies. For example, maybe I can invite you to, to look into your the way how you look into a canonical novitiate. Um, we call it canonical novitiate. But, uh, many still have misconceptions about uh, uh, but it's not this part of formation. Uh, like uh, going out from the novitiate house during canonical novitiate is not allowed, even just to buy uh, vinegar outside is not allowed. So this very old understanding of, of, of the novitiate. And may, still many other provisions probably in your in your constitutions, in your in your in your proper law, that should be interpreted in the light of of this gospel of this gospel values, in the light of synodality. Practices that are no longer uh, life giving that may need to be to be to be changed, to be adapted to to the new to the new. Maybe later on you you may have questions in this regard. The fourth uh, point that I would like to share with you is that a synodal religious formation takes place in a synodal community. We say that uh, it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes the entire community, not only the formators, but the entire community where the foreman finds himself. And by this community, I mean not only the ad intra community, not only the religious community, but also the ad extra community. 
Formation depends to a great extent on the quality of the community where we live. Modeling is the best way to form the formants. A community is formative to the extent that it permits each one of its members to grow in fidelity to the Lord according to the charism of the Institute. I, I realize that the positive influence of a joyful veteran missionary who is aging gracefully, like in our case, Father Blanco, is worth more than all our classes of chastity, poverty, and obedience combined. I lived with Father Blanc when I was the prefect of students in the theology house, and he was there. And I think he had more influence than, than me as the, the direct formator. I even told him, Father, if you even if you do not say anything, because if he says uh, his theology of, of Mary, his Mariology, it's very, very outdated. And he said that even if you not say anything, you can already influence in a positive way our seminarians. And it's holiness by contamination, I, I told him. No. So the brothers next door, the, we call them saints next door. Pope Francis calls them with that word in the in this uh, exhortation, uh, Gaudete Sotate. Those who to live exemplary lives are saints next door. And they have great influence. So I'm referring to this kind of community. Now, there are moments where we assigned, when we assigned our formants exposures during their pastoral year to small communities. And the influence of the community is, is very, very big. Of course, I'm not only referring to the ad intra community. The formation community can also refer to the world outside our religious community, especially the poor in our apostolate areas. Now, needless to say that uh, the effect of our apostolic works in our apostolate areas is so great in the way how we perceive our life and mission as consecrated persons. Now, Pope Francis would consider the poor, especially the poor, in your case, the handicapped. The poor are not only recipients of our charitable works. They are our formators. They are our formators. They are our true evangelizers. Inserted formation communities are now common in our case. After secondary theology, our seminarians live in the squatters areas for a year. And it has a lot of bearing in, in the way how they, they live their consecrated life. For mission, it's nothing but for mission. Pope Francis would remind us that if our formation is not integrated with mission, it will be disoriented. Fifthly, I have only six points here, but the, the fifth point is a synodal religious formation gives premium to ongoing formation. As formators, especially speaking from my own experience, in the past I had a tendency to look for tangible results. I always measure the growth of the, the foreman <clears throat> on how much he has accomplished the assignments, how much he has uh, <clears throat> obeyed the indications that I gave. And we are unmindful that formation is a continuous journey of conversion. We have the tendency to, res to be result-oriented instead of being patient and discerning. Ideally, the role of formators is not to look for some tangible and immediate results, but to form progressively the candidates. And for this reason, formators should be sufficiently prepared so as not to be deceived or to deceive regarding a presumed consistency and maturity of the foreman. I would like to quote Father Amadeo Sincini in this regard. We are told to remain novices all throughout life, to mature progressively in us the attitude of the disciple, always listening to the teacher and of the pilgrim, always following in the right direction. This is in line with what Gusti said about uh, this learner-oriented type of formation. Because Vita Consacrata would tell us that formation never ends. 
Father Blanco would remind us that even the temptations will not cease until a few minutes after we die. <laughs> even if we die, there are still temptations. <laughs> but after minutes, some minutes, when we find ourselves in the grave, that's only the moment when temptation dies. Of course, it's a little exaggeration, but just to emphasize that our formation never ends. That's why now <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, especially the, <clears throat> the dicastery of the consecrated life, emphasizes formation as a whole, not to dichotomize initial and ongoing, but a progressive process of conversion. That's why even in constitutions where ongoing formation is placed, before initial, it is allowable now. <clears throat> to follow Christ means that one is always on the road, that one is on one's guard against sclerosis or ossification. That's why Canon 661 of the New Code of Canon Law reminds us throughout their in entire religious life, they are to continue carefully their own spiritual, doctrinal, and practical formation. And superiors are to provide them with the resources and the time to do this. Its religious institute, therefore, has the task of planning and realizing a program of permanent formation suitable for all its members. Ongoing formation should not be treated as a footnote to initial formation. And in... Ongoing formation also applies to us, to, to you as formators. Major superiors should offer the formators programs and opportunities which assure the necessary theological and pedagogical, pedagogical formation, spiritual formation, competence in the human sciences, etc. Format formators should be expert, particularly in matters which refer to the spiritual patrimony of the founder or founders. You know, when somebody, when a formator leaves the formation house and eventually the religious life, so many are disoriented. So many become so discouraged because they look at us, they look as formators at par with the superiors. In fact, I remember the vicar general mentioning to me one time when he heard his canonical visitation. The formator should be the best, especially the novice master, for example, should be the best member of the province. That why, that's why uh, they become so disenchanted with when formators leave the congregation or the religious life. Formators are so crucial to religious life because its future and its mission depend to a great extent on the quality of formation that they give to those who are next in line. As we say, no one can give what he or she does not have without a suitable formation to the demands of today and without credible formators that facilitate this kind of formation, we run the risk of losing the sense of who we truly are as, a, as religious or who we should be. It is for this reason that the post-synodal exhortation Vita Consecrata reminds us the importance of the training of suitable formators who will fulfill their tasks in a spirit of communion with the whole church. Lastly, for me, a synodal formation acknowledges the importance of collaboration and solidarity with other congregations. A concrete expression of collaboration and solidarity among religious families is the initiative now spread in various contexts of creating inter-institute centers of formation, like ICLA, for example, like uh, the Sojourn for the postulants, I think. Then uh, there's one for the novices. There's also one in Tagaytay, etc. Common formation programs for the various stages of initial and ongoing formation, especially where individual institutes do not have the sufficient means to offer a complete formation to their members. But I I heard Father Luigi earlier in the introduction that uh, you are small. But when we are religious, having received a special charism of the Spirit, we should not 
talk about being small or being big charisms in the church. Because all our gifts are of the Holy Spirit. Now, there should be no competition among us. Now, this is uh, especially addressed to those who, who think that they are more special because they are members of big congregations. In fact, I discourage the, these words, international and local congregations, because this gives a connotation that the local congregations are inferior to international congregations. We can use the right terms like uh, pontifical right congregations or days and right congregations, but that international or local. Because even if you're local, when you go to other countries, you're also international. But more than that is this connotation of superiority. No? Because in the Philippines, for example, if there are small chickens, we call them native chickens. If there are small uh, fruits, uh, native fruits. And if there are big ones, they're called uh, American, <laughs> American or, or hybrid or whatever. So I also impress upon the religious, every time I give a talk, to refrain from using terminologies that do not promote synodality and equality, no? like using uh, local congregations, uh, international congregations. And little by little, I'm able to, to convince them that these are not the right terminologies. And there are many more words that should not be used. St. John Paul II spoke about this collaboration in an audience granted to the International Union of Spears General when he said, the essential thing is that on the part of religious families, there should be absolute cooperation in forming their members in a total, sincere, and joyous love for Jesus Christ, who is deeply known, followed, and obeyed. I was happy when I, one time I celebrated this Mass during the concluding ceremony of the postulants in Tagaytay during this this. Uh, concluding ceremony of the post, this uh, group of postulants, intercongregational consulacy program. I saw among them days and seminarians of Imos. Days and seminarians are already included here. Because if you talk about mutual relations between bishops, between days and clergy and the religious, we should start from the beginning of racial formation because this would listen, this would minimize the, the biases. Mutual, unhealthy mutual relations happens when we have biases. But if we have this intercongregational, inter diocesan, and uh, religious collaboration, then it would help us promote a synodal church. Allow me to use the imagery of David as my conclusion. There's a tension of the classic the old and what is happening today, the old and the new wine skins, if you want, when it comes to formation. The biblical image of David in the book of Samuel helps us understand this tension. The young David offered to fight the giant, putting his trust in God. So Saul put his armor, helmet, and weapons on him. Saul placed all those structures on David, and he could not handle that. He could not walk. Then the Holy Spirit inspired him, and David took off all that stuff that was weighing on him. He took the shepherd's crook, picked up some stones, and he placed them in the bag. He grabbed a sling and went to fight with Goliath, the giant. And David was a man of discernment. In 2023, in the session of the Synod of Bishop on Synodality, I was drawn to the images of the Pope, the Cardinals, Bishops, consecrated persons, and lay participants sitting together at tables in ordinary attire in sharp contrast to the usual Synod photos of rows of formally garbed clerics waiting to receive the permission to speak. In the Synod, all have equal amount of time to talk. This can also be a good image of a synodal religious formation based on friendship and equality deriving from our baptismal consecration. Synodality should shape the initial and ongoing formation of religious and consecrated persons. 
thank you for listening. I don't know if yeah, you got something from my sharing, but if you have some clarifications to make, I'll be very happy to, to respond to them. Thank you, Father.